Michigan provided for the establishment of public libraries at the time of statehood. As the territory prepared for admission to the Union in 1837, the first state constitution was drafted. This document, created in 1835, specifically addressed libraries in Article 10 and stated, as soon as the circumstances of the state will permit, the legislature shall provide for the establishment of libraries, one at least in each township. And the Constitution went on to designate penal fines as a funding mechanism for the libraries, and that mechanism is still in place in part today. The following year, the newly appointed state superintendent of public instruction told the legislature that he thought that the primary schools would be the best place for libraries to be established. So in 1837, the legislature took him up on his suggestion and they placed the responsibility for libraries with the public school districts. So the first book collections in the communities of Michigan were in the classrooms. Essentially, the legislature had provided for school libraries, not for public libraries. A revision of the school law came in 1843, which allowed for the establishment of what was called township libraries. They were to be placed under the control of each township clerk, and the township residents were permitted to pass a tax levy to fund these libraries. So that sounded like a public library, but the schools were still given the responsibility for maintaining the collections. These weren't true public libraries, and three years after this law was passed, less than half of the townships of Michigan have availed themselves of the provision. So Public Act 164 of 1877 was our first real public library law. It authorized cities, incorporated villages, and townships to establish and maintain or contract for the use of free public libraries and reading rooms. And it spelled out the process for creating and funding a library. Many public libraries in Michigan were created under PA 164 and still operate under its provisions today. So what was the situation in Rochester and Avon? Let's take a look back at Rochester in the year 1870. It had been 53 years since the Graham Party had stopped along Paint Creek to establish what would become Rochester. In that half century, the original pioneers had passed on and a new generation of migrants from the eastern seaboard and the mid-Atlantic states had settled here and established a thriving agricultural community. The population of Avon Township and its two villages, Stony Creek and Rochester, stood at a combined total of about 1,800, so roughly the population of one of our high schools today. The Civil War had ended five years earlier, and the soldiers of Avon had returned to their farms and businesses. But Rochester was still somewhat isolated because it had no newspaper, so the news came through the papers from Pontiac, Detroit, and elsewhere that were delivered on the daily stage. The economy of Rochester was based upon the agricultural production of the surrounding township. Avon was filled with family farms producing wheat, corn, oats, and wool primarily, and we had several mills that processed these crops, but selling them meant carrying them to Pontiac or Detroit by wagon. In 1872, there was a game changer when the Detroit and Bay City Railroad built a line through Rochester. The railroad was championed by Lysander Woodward, a prominent local farmer and civic leader who made stump speeches in the towns all up and down the proposed line to try to get access to the right of way that they would need for the tracks. The effect of this railroad on Rochester was enormous and cannot be overstated. For the first time, the residents of Rochester and Avon had fast and reliable transportation to major cities. Farmers could ship crops easily from the depot in town. And with the railroad tracks came the telegraph lines. And that brought faster communication and with that came something that Rochester really needed, a newspaper. 
Truman B. Fox and his wife Sarah established the Rochester era in 1873, just a few months after the trains began running. Now Rochester residents not only had local news, but they had state, national, and international dispatches. And along with essays, editorials, sermons, and serial fiction, they had a lot of reading material available to them. Just a few months before the newspaper had launched its inaugural edition, the youth of Rochester had organized, organized a literary society. The society started with six members, but it grew to more than 30 in just a few months' time. And this group of teens and young adults met weekly to read and discuss essays and debate topics of current interest. The first officers of the society were Cyrenius Parker, age 19, Eugene Carlton, age 15, Henrietta Hutaf, age 15, and Eva Woodward, age 17. Eugene Carlton was destined to become a leading businessman in Flint, Michigan, where he operated the Emmy Carlton Company and the Industrial Realty Company. And he also left his mark on Rochester because he built what was for the time a rather substantial home on East Street that was designed by the prominent Detroit architect John Scott. And John Scott, coincidentally, would become Eva Woodward's brother-in-law. Henrietta Hutaf married Samuel Richardson, who was running the Detroit or the Rochester Woolen Mill at the time. And after they moved to Seattle, Washington, Etta went into real estate management, and she was described in her obituary as a well-known Seattle businesswoman and the mother of a Washington state legislator. And that brings us to Eva Woodward, the daughter of Lysander Woodward, the man who was responsible for bringing the railroad to town. Eva attended the University of Michigan, which was somewhat unusual for a woman in her day. Then she taught high school at East Saginaw for a couple of years and ran an unsuccessful bid for county school superintendent before marrying a Detroit pharmacist and businessman named Arthur S. Parker. The Parkers lived most of, their, uh, most of the year in Detroit, where Arthur Parker ran the Detroit Drug Company. But they summered at the Woodward home here in Rochester, where they eventually retired. And we will be talking much more about Eva Woodward Parker a little bit later in the story. Now, these young people of the Literary Society were no lightweights. The topics they chose to debate ranged from history to philosophy to politics. And because the society's secretary dutifully sent in reports to the Pontiac Gazette every week, we have a pretty good idea of what they were up to. Here are some of the questions that they debated. Resolved that the boundary waters, meaning the Detroit and St. Clair rivers, between the US and Canada should be bridged. And their decision was negative. Resolved that knowledge is of more benefit than money. And the decision affirmative. Ought the manufacture of intoxicating liquors be allowed? Decision negative. Resolved that capital punishment should be abolished? Decision affirmative. Resolved that foreign immigration is danger to the best interests of our country? Decision negative. And resolved that women should be allowed to vote? Decision affirmative. Within its first year of operation, this society had formed a small library and was hosting entertainment events to raise money to buy materials. The newspaper praised the young people for their efforts and for making their reading room available to the general public. So this was the first semblance of a public library that we had in Rochester. Not to be outdone by their children, the adults of Rochester formed a literary society of their own in late 1873, but they called theirs the Rochester Lecture and Library Association. The town's leading professionals, including Dr. Jeremiah Wilson, attorney E.R. Wilcox, and publisher Truman Fox were the first officers of this organization. And their format followed the same format that the youth were using. The youth organization lasted until 1879 when it disbanded and dispersed its book collection. The adult society managed to carry on for another three years, keeping its reading room in the office of the Rochester era newspaper, 
but it also faded away in 1881. The following year, the literary torch was passed to another organization that would prove more robust. The Avon Ladies Library Association was chartered in 1882 with 41 members. The society established a library and funded it by selling stock in the association, $1.50 a share. By 1894, the association had a book collection of 750 volumes, which was housed in a second floor room above the George Dennis Drug Store. Now that building was located on the corner of 4th and Main, and longtime residents of Rochester would call this the DNC corner. If you're a newer resident, it's where DeMarco's restaurant is today. So this is that corner. Let's see if we have this on here. This building right here is the Lambertson block that was torn down in order for the DNC building to be built. And the Dennis Drug Store is right here. So the Avon Ladies Library was in the upstairs room here. These two buildings are still standing on Main Street today. This fancy cornice is gone now, but the Hello Fancy Boutique and the sports memorabilia store are in these two places. And then this building down here may look familiar to you. That's where Holy Cannoli is. So that's the block that we're talking about. Members of the Library Association were allowed free use of the book collection, and non-members could use it if they paid a $1 subscription fee. And subscription libraries were nothing new. Uh, this model of library support went back to the founding of the Boston Athenaeum in, 19, in 1807. And likewise, the push to organize library collections in towns across the United States, including in Michigan, was chiefly conducted by women. Many of our local libraries grew out of collections that were started and originally managed by ladies' literary and library associations, and Rochester was no different. The Avon Ladies Library Association offered its library for 26 years, and it even published a catalog of the collection. The cover is shown right there. But it voted to dissolve and sell its collection in 1908. It would be 10 more years before another library would be organized in Rochester. And that happened in 1918. The Rochester Women's Club was the group that brought the new library to fruition. The Women's Club had received the donation of the private library of a man named Calvin Harlow Green. Mr. Green was a self-taught literary scholar and he had an impressive, for the time, collection of 300 volumes of literature. He was a devotee of the writings of the Transcendentalists and particularly fond of Henry David Thoreau, with whom he carried on a personal correspondence. At one point, Green had asked Thoreau to send him a picture and Thoreau said he had no likeness of himself, so Green sent him a few dollars and said, would you please go have one made? So Henry David Thoreau visited an artist in Massachusetts to get the photo, not photo, but the picture made, and the result was what scholars refer to as the Maxim Daguerreotype, the first ever known image of Henry David Thoreau, and it exists because Calvin Green of Rochester, Michigan asked for it to be made and that image now resides in the National Portrait Gallery. But by this time, Mr. Green had passed on to his reward, and his son had provided his book collection to the Rochester Women's Club, and the Rochester Women's Club decided we can use this collection as the core of a new public library, and that's exactly what they did. They called their new library the Rochester Public Library. And this is one of the books from the collection that is still in uh, today at the Rochester Hills Museum at Van Hoosen Farm. The library was entitled, entirely funded by donations, and that was donation of material, donation of funds to administer the library, and donation of time to run the library. It was housed in the Rosso building, 
which was at the corner of Maine and what we know today as West University Drive. But at that time, it was called Fifth Street. So here's a photo of the Rosso building. That's the big house right here. And this is showing the West University Drive side of the building and Main Street is running over here. You can see the standard gas station right there. The Rosso building and the gas station were torn down in the 70s. The donut shop was built where the gas station sh is shown in this picture, and the gas station moved across the street to this location. So now everybody should understand what corner we're talking about. And the Rosso building uh, housed the Rochester Public Library that was run by the Women's Club. But the Women's Club soon realized this is a lot of work to operate the library and to constantly be looking for donations. And they didn't want to be full-time employees of the library, so they decided something had to happen. And they decided that they needed to go for a millage to try to formally establish the library under law and get a stable source of income to run it. So they campaigned to place a millage question on the ballot for that purpose. The millage asked was not to exceed one mill, and it passed by a razor-thin margin of 12 votes on April 7, 1924. So that date can properly be said to be the exact and precise birth date of the Avon Township Public Library. Now that the library had a statutory foundation and a funding source, a board of trustees was elected to govern it. The first board members were Eva Barwise and Madeline Curtis of the Women's Club, banker Milton Hazelswert, industrialist and financier Fred Shinnick, businessman Roy McCornack, and attorney Henry Wood Axford. I'm sorry I couldn't find a photo of Madeline Curtis, but there are the other five. And these photos were taken at various time in history, not necessarily in 1924 when they formed the first library board. During its first year, this new board had to find a home for the library, hire a librarian, and see to the cataloging of the collection that it had inherited from the Women's Club Library. It probably did not hurt that one of the library board members was also president of the Rochester National Bank which was in the process of erecting a brand new building on the southwest corner of 4th and Main Streets. And here's that building. Rooms on the second floor of the new bank at the back became the first official home of the brand new Avon Township Public Library. A bigger challenge than finding a place was the selection of a librarian. The below market pay of $50 a month that the board was offering attracted no candidates. And they were turned down by the first 10 people to whom they made offers of employment. At the, as the end of 1924 was approaching and the grand opening of the library was only weeks away, the pressure was on. So having been rebuffed by candidates who had credentials in librarianship or education, they turned instead to a local woman named Florence Comstock, who had no library experience or training whatsoever, but had been working as a bookkeeper in a Detroit business. Ms. Comstock accepted the salary of $80 a month that they decided to offer her. That was still below market for a library of this size, by the way. And they began working uh, in January of 1925. She received a few weeks of on-the-job training from someone from the uh, State Library, and then she was on her own. The library formally opened to the public on February 7th, 1925, and the evidence suggests that Ms. Comstock did very well considering her level of experience and preparation and what she was given to work with. Use of the library soared, and Ms. Comstock made her first foray into programming by offering children's story time. Now, the situation in the bank building wasn't ideal, and it was only four years 
before the board was actively looking for another home for the library. The board became aware of the availability of a large house at 210 West 5th Street, now West University Drive, which had been the residence of Charles and Maddie Griggs. And there is a picture of the Griggs house. Griggs had been a prominent businessman. He was the founder of the Rochester Elevator. His house had been designed by the Detroit architect John Scott, the son-in-law of Lysander Woodward. But by 1928, Mr. Griggs was long deceased and his widow Maddie was aged and in failing health. So she sold her house to the library board with the proviso that she would have the use of some of the second floor living space for the remainder of her life. Now the library board had its own building and its own property, but hard times were right around the corner. The grand opening of the Griggs location happened in early 1929, and we all know what happened in October 1929. The Great Depression forced the library board to curtail hours and to reduce the salaries of Florence Comstock and her part-time assistant, Adele Spencer. When Ms. Spencer protested in a resignation letter to the board that she simply could not work for a salary of 25 cents per hour, the board opted to leave her position vacant. The economic recovery of the mid to late 1930s did allow the board to restore hours and services and to bump up the librarian's salary again. In 1937, the simple hire of a part-time assistant turned out to be a historical milestone for the library. Leona Schrader, a 19-year-old woman who had graduated from Rochester High School the year before, was hired as Ms. Comstock's assistant. Three years later, Florence Comstock died, and the responsibility for the library was placed in the hands of the young Ms. Com uh, Ms. Schrader, who was given the title of acting librarian. The board searched for a replacement for Florence Comstock, but after reviewing several applications and conducting some interviews, it failed to make a job offer to anyone being content to leave Leona Schrader in charge. The board's inattention to the position of librarian would continue not just for months or years, but for decades before it would be addressed. In the meantime, there were big developments on the building front. Back in 1933, the board had been notified that the library would become the eventual beneficiary of the estate of Eva Woodward Parker. This was the same Eva Woodward who had been an officer of the Rochester Literary Society as a teenager, and the same Eva Woodward who was the daughter of Lysander Woodward. When she died in 1933, her will stipulated that her estate be used to care for her longtime housekeeper and friend, Mary Welters. Upon the death of Miss Welters, the remaining estate was left to the Avon Township Library to build a new brick library building to be named the Woodward Memorial. Now the board had been aware for some years that the Woodward Parker money would be coming in eventually, and the, beque the bequest was realized in 1947 when Mary Welters died and the residual estate was liquidated, leaving about $100,000 available to the library for the construction of a brand new building. After some discussion, the board opted to erect its new building on the property at 210 West 5th Street, which meant that the venerable Griggs house had to go. The house was offered to sale for sale to anyone who wanted to move it off the lot, but there were no takers. So it was demolished early in 1950, and the construction of the new library got underway. The library collection was moved to the American Legion Hall during the construction period. Although the Griggs house was sacrificed, it's notable that the ornamental trees on the front lawn were not. These were Camperdown elms, a special tree that's created through a grafting process, not grown from seed. 
And these trees had been on the lot at least since 1907 because they appear as full-grown trees in a 1907 view of the house. The elms were saved and they were factored into the landscape plan for the new library building. The design of the building was drawn by architect William Edward Capp, who was also the architect for Meadowbrook Hall. Capp's design was meant to pay homage to the New England and Mid-Atlantic architecture that Rochester's settlers would have been familiar with. And it was also meant to blend amicably with the residential neighborhood around it. As dedication day approached, the name of the library became a problem to be solved. The Parker Will had specified that the new building be called Woodward Memorial. But the library's legal name was Avon Township Public Library. And that could not easily be changed, nor did the board think it would be wise to do so. The solution to the dilemma was to carve the name Avon Township Library in the lintel over the front entrance. But the building, and not the library as an entity, would be called the Woodward Memorial. So a plaque was placed on the front of the building, naming it the Woodward Memorial Library. And a prominent sign above the circulation desk proudly proclaimed, Woodward Memorial, a generous gift of Eva Woodward Parker. Problem solved. The new library was formally dedicated on Memorial Day, 1951. And Milton Woodward, a grandson of Lysander and a nephew of Eva Woodward Parker, was in attendance to represent the Woodward family. Here are a couple of interior shots of the Woodward Memorial Building. This is the reference room. And through that archway in the middle, you can see the circulation desk. And over that desk was the sign uh, proclaiming Eva Woodward Parker's gift. And this is a closer up view of the circulation desk and that sign. And the lady right in the middle is Leona Schrader. A couple of years after the building opened, the library board purchased a cast flower urn for Eva Woodward's grave at Mount Avon Cemetery. And ever since that time, the library staff has placed flowers on her grave every year on Memorial Day. During the 1950s, Avon Township was growing exponentially. Those family farms that surrounded Rochester were being subdivided and new residents were flocking to the area. So the new Woodward Memorial Library found itself out of space by the end of the decade and it was enlarged again, funded by a bequest from Grace and May Curry in 1963. As the decade of the 1960s began to unfold, Avon Township Library had been without the services of a head librarian for two decades. Leona Schrader was still considered the acting librarian. Developments in library service across Michigan and Oakland County were leaving Avon Township behind. And the problem of professional development in the library was becoming acute. At this point, a few determined citizens stepped forward to found a Friends of the Library organization and do what was necessary to get the library moving forward. If the women's organizations of Rochester can be credited with getting a library started in the first place, the Friends of the Library can be given all the credit for bringing professional standards and additional funding to the library. The Friends drew attention to the library's chronic underfunding and pushed for the money to allow the library to hire its first professionally trained credentialed librarian. Funding had always been the principal obstacle for this. And the Friends campaigned for an increase in budget to make this hire possible. And the long-awaited budget allocation was made in the 1963-64 budget and the board hired Sheila Klein as its first professionally trained librarian with a master's degree in librarianship. Ms. Klein came on board in September 1963. But unfortunately, even with the funding, the task of bringing Avon Township Library under professional management did not go smoothly. 
For various reasons, the library went through three head librarians in six years, between 1963 and 1969, with Leona Schrader filling in again every time somebody resigned. <laughs> During this period, librarians Sheila Klein and Clara Bryce stayed in the job for about two years each, while Ambrose Petullo, who by the way is the only male head librarian in the history of the library, lasted 10 months. <laughs> and he's kind of an interesting story. He came to Avon Township Library from a college setting, and when he left here after 10 months, he went back to an academic setting. So I don't know if he wasn't, just wasn't suited to small town public library service or, or what his problem was, but anyway, um, I can tell you that in spite of the fact that he only served 10 months, he was a legend among the staff. I started working at Avon Township Library a full decade after Mr. Petullo was gone, and the longtime staff was still talking about him. <laughs> the full-time clerks, ladies like Winnie Hanlon, Nina French, Phyllis Jackson, and Leona Schrader, um, they took their jobs very seriously, and they were not impressed with Mr. Petullo. <laughs> they told me that he used to come in in the morning and set up his mirror and shaving kit at the library circulation desk after the doors had opened to the public for the day and proceed to shave and groom himself at the circulation desk in full view of everyone. Um, that story was still going around when I was working here in the 70s and early 80s. So. The churning at the top of the staff aside, the friends pushed for the establishment of a dedicated children's department and provided funding to create the Margaret C. Norton Children's Room and the Helen Southgate Williams Literature Collection. Helen Williams was a literature consultant and teacher who ran a beloved children's bookstore in Rochester and hosted story time in her shop and in the public schools where she was known as the Story Lady. She lent her expertise to the library to curate a quality children's book collection in the absence of a children's librarian. The children's room of the library where the new and improved book collection was housed was named for Margaret C. Norton, a longtime library trustee in 1967. On other fronts, the year 1967 was a turbulent one for the library. It was in that year that the village of Rochester became the city of Rochester independent of Avon Township. Villages in Michigan were part of the townships in which they were located, and the village residents were subject to township taxes, even when they had their own village council and village taxes, as Rochester did. But when the village of Rochester became the city of Rochester in February 1967, a municipal identity crisis of sorts was triggered. Avon Township, maintained its offices and town hall in Rochester at 4th and Pine Streets. So as of the cityhood date, the township hall was no longer physically located in the township. The township also owned two other assets that were no longer within its borders, Mount Avon Cemetery and Avon Park. Through a series of negotiations, the cemetery and the park were transferred to the new city of Rochester. And the Township Hall just remained in Rochester until 1980 when the Township built its new building out on Avon Road, which is the city of Rochester Hills City Hall today. But the cityhood problem, the issue was still a bit of a problem for the library, although the library was independently governed by its own board of trustees. The library received its funding from a tax levy upon the property owners of Avon Township. And while the village of Rochester had been part of that township and had paid those taxes, the city of Rochester did not. So that meant, number one, the Avon Township Library was no longer physically located in Avon Township. Number two, the residents of Rochester, since they no longer paid taxes to support Avon Township Library, were not entitled to its services. And number three, Margaret C. Norton, who had been a member of the Library Board of Trustees for more than three decades, 
could not keep her seat because she resided in the city of Rochester, not in the township of Avon. So it was a mess. But the legalities were eventually straightened out reasonably well. A contract for services was signed with the city of Rochester to provide library services for its residents in exchange for an annual fee. This was the same arrangement that the library already had in place with Oakland Township by that time. Mrs. Norton, unfortunately, did have to resign her seat and was replaced on the board with a township resident. Library drama was not over, however. In 1969, the library board decided to join a cooperative, the Wayne Oakland Federated Library System, which is known today as TLN. The board also decided to apply for a Michigan State Aid grant to public libraries for the very first time. And these two decisions brought specific scrutiny to the library's finances and uncovered some problems. The voters of the township had established an independent millage for support of the library in 1924. But in Avon Township, like in a number of townships in the state at the time, the township elected to simply pay the library what its levy would have raised out of township funds rather than separately collecting and distributing the library levy. And this procedure led to a couple of problems. First of all, that library funds and township funds were being commingled. And second, that the unspent library funds were reverting to the township at the end of the year and not being carried over to the library's benefit. So in an effort to end this practice, in 1969, the library board sought an attorney general's opinion on the matter. Michigan Attorney General Frank Kelly ruled that the township was in error. The township could not exercise budgetary control over the library in any way, shape, or form, and if it acted as the library's fiscal agent, it was required to separate library funds from township funds. The ruling, which came in late 1969, set 1970 up to be a watershed year for the library. In 1970, the library was free of township oversight and a new librarian, Patricia Alessandro, came on board. Ms. Alessandro got to work immediately. She hired additional trained librarians, including the library's first children's librarian. With a professional staff in place, the library began to offer a wide range of public programming. Next, Alessandro turned her attention to long-range planning, including the woeful overcrowding in the library building. Avon Township by this time was entering another phase of exponential growth. Oakland University was becoming an increasingly important presence in the community and a public library building that could accommodate seating for 49 people in 4,300 square feet was just not going to cut it. Added on to that, the area was forecasted to see double-digit population growth in the coming decade. Under Alessandro's leadership, a study was conducted and the options for expanding the library were considered. The board optioned land at Hampton Corners for a potential branch location, but eventually decided to go with a 20,000 square foot addition to the existing building at 210 West University. This addition necessitated a property purchase and the demolition of a house standing to the east of the library building. So here's a before shot. You can see the library building and the house just to the east of it that needed to be demolished. The price tag for this uh, expansion was going to be $1 million, which would be raised by a bond sale. The bond sale again opened the barely healed rift between the library board and the township board. The township electorate was generally conservative and there was significant anti-tax sentiment in the community. The bond issue did pass in the fall of 1973 with a very modest 63 vote margin. But after the election, the sale of the bonds was delayed by the township's last ditch effort to force the library board to relocate the library into the actual township. The situation deteriorated to the point that the two parties appeared to be headed to court. 
but it was suddenly resolved when the Oakland County Circuit Court ruled on a parallel case in West Bloomfield Township. When the court ruled that the West Bloomfield Township Board had no legal or fiscal authority over the decisions of the West Bloomfield Township Library Board, the same issues which existed in Avon Township were similarly resolved. So the bond sale went forward and the ground was broken for the library addition in 1975. When the new building opened in 1976, it was five times larger in square footage and it could accommodate a collection of 90,000 volumes as compared to 20,000 in the old footprint. So there's the after picture. And you can see the new addition to the east of the library building. After eight years at the helm of the library during which she successfully brought in a major addition and established a professional staff, Pat Alessandro resigned to pursue a new career in law. Patricia Olson, who later remarried and became Patricia Wilson, succeeded her as director of the Avon Township Library, and it would be her charge to move the library from paper and pencil into the world of automation. But before the library made that tradition to the, or transition to the era of computer technology, it sadly had to close another era. In January 1979, Leona Schrader died after a battle with cancer. She had never retired from the library. She only stopped working when her declining health no longer permitted her to walk to work and sit at her desk. Her tenure at the library spanned her entire working career, 42 years in all, and included nearly a quarter century of serving in the role as acting librarian while the head librarian position had been vacant at various periods of time. In Ms. Schrader's memory, the library board commissioned a mural by local artist Michael Paradise, and that can be seen on the second floor of this building. Patricia Wilson served as library director for a decade during which the township of Avon and the city of Rochester argued bitterly over issues of annexation and consolidation and the two eventually decided to face the future as separate cities. Avon Township voted to become the city of Rochester Hills in 1984, and once again, the library's identity was impacted. The library board, hoping to foster a climate of healing, first chose the name of Rochester Community Library to embrace all of Rochester, Rochester Hills, and Oakland Township in a sort of generic way. But the new City Council of Rochester Hills strongly objected to any name that did not include the actual owner of the library. Um, so the board acceded to the City Council's request and the name officially became City of Rochester Hills Public Library or Rochester Hills Public Library to be a little shorter. Faced again with exponential growth in the new city of Rochester Hills, as well as in Oakland Township and Rochester, which it served by contract, the library board began a study to address future needs. The results made it clear that a new building was necessary, and since the existing site was already maxed out, a new library site would be needed. Before shovels could go in the ground, Pat Wilson resigned to move abroad with her husband and the library board selected then head of adult services, Christine Lynn Haig, as the new library director. Lynn Haig had the task of helping the library board navigate the minefield of selecting a new library site. There were strong voices in favor of finally moving the library out of Rochester and into the city that funded it but where the library should be located within Rochester Hills was still a subject of great debate. There were many opinions, and the library board sifted through no less than 17 options before settling on a parcel on North Rochester Road, north of the old Twist Drill property. Plans were drawn for the new building, but in the end, stricter wetland setbacks that were adopted by the Rochester Hills City Council rendered the parcel un unusable for library purposes. And so it was back to the drawing board on site selection. An offer from the Rochester DDA made the eventual library site possible. 
the DDA had a strong interest in keeping the library in downtown Rochester as a way to keep the downtown vibrant. And they also wanted to repel undesirable development of the old Mill Pond property in the northeastern section of downtown. So the DDA offered $2.5 million to assist the library in procuring a seven-acre parcel of the old Mill Pond property, which would leave the library board to cover half a million of the property price tag. The offer was accepted and ground was broken for the new building in the spring of 1991. When the new library opened in November 1992, there was a parade from the old building to the new to open the ceremonies. The new library on Old Town Road was 70,000 square feet, nearly three times the size of the building that it replaced. And it was capable of housing a collection of a quarter of a million items. The new library's landscape featured a throwback to its former location. The library board had considered moving the Griggs Camperdown elm trees from the old library site to the new one, but they were advised that the trees, which were by then more than a century old, might not even survive the move, and it would be very expensive to move them. So not wanting to risk the survival of the trees, they decided to leave them in place at the old building, and instead, a gift of the Na uh, Women's National Farm and Garden Association was used to purchase a new Camperdown elm tree, which was placed on the lawn of the new library near the west-facing entrance. Unfortunately, the last remaining Griggs Camperdown elm was destroyed just a few months ago. Having delivered a new library building that could serve the community well into the 21st century, Director Lindhag was not finished. It was the dawn of the digital age, and Rochester Hills Public Library led the way. The library was a founding member and driving force behind the creation of Metronet, which was a virtual consortium that provided support for technology development in libraries. Metronet was investigating how a little known resource called the internet could be leveraged by libraries to deliver information. Few private homes had internet connections at the time, so Metrono, uh, Metronet set up its own ISP for use by its member libraries. And because Rochester Hills Public Library was the very first to go live with the system, it has the distinction of being the first library in the state of Michigan to offer free dial-up internet access to its patrons, and that happened in 1994. Two years later, the library launched its very first website in an era when few libraries had such a thing. The American Library Association recognized this achievement in 1996 when it honored RHPL with the Gale Research Award for Excellence in Reference and Adult Services. Director Lynn Haig, who had served for a decade accepted an opportunity in 1998 to build the neighboring Clinton Macomb library system from the ground up. While leadership at RHPL was placed in the hands of Sandra Matsko, who had been serving as the library's head of adult services. Director Matsko put the library on wheels, introducing a bookmobile in 2003 that could serve as a mobile branch in the furthest reaches of the library's service area, as well as at schools and at community events. The Friends of the Library provided some of the startup funding for the Bookmobile Initiative. When Director Matt Sko announced her retirement in 2005, Christine Lynn Haig returned to RHPL as director in what was called the shortest director search in history. <laughs> and she served until her retirement in 2019. She spent a total of 31 years at RHPL 24 of them as director, and this made her the longest tenured library director in the institution's history, just edging out Leona Schrader by about two years. <laughs> Lynn Haig had literally seen the library move from paper and pencil record keeping to becoming a state and national leader in digital library technology in the span of her career here. The library collection, which had been almost exclusively print-based when she arrived, now encompassed a wide variety of digital resources, including e-books, 
streaming audio and video, subscription databases, online courses and tutoring, a local history archive, and much more. The library board selected Julianne Morian to succeed Director Lynn Haig, and I can imagine that Director Morian could not in her wildest dreams have imagined the task that was about to confront her. <laughs> she had been in the director's chair for only a matter of weeks when the COVID-19 pandemic hit and a statewide shutdown and stay at home order was announced. But I think we can all agree that she and her staff rose to the occasion. They nimbly adapted library services to show off the library's digital resources as much as possible, moved programming online, and even used the library's 3D printer to manufacture face shields for medical personnel. One area in which they did not have to adapt was curbside delivery. We know that during COVID, libraries and all kinds of businesses were scrambling to find a way to provide curbside service to their customers. But RHPL only needed to carry on what they had been doing for 30 years since the Old Town Library opened with a drive-through window in 1992. The entire COVID debacle served to prove the words of American clergyman and essayist Henry Ward Beecher, who wrote in 1859, a library is not a luxury, but one of the necessities of life. When I began writing the library's history during the COVID shutdown, those words rang true for me. They seemed highly appropriate to be adapted for the title of the library history book. Today, Rochester Hills Public Library is one of the busiest libraries in the state of Michigan with annual circulation numbers in the millions. In its first year of operation, the Avon Township Public Library reported a total circulation of 14,543 items. In 2022, the library reported a total circulation of over one and a half million items. And that's 100 times greater than it was a century ago. I hope you will join me in celebrating 100 years of progress and promise at Rochester Hills Public Library this year. For those who are interested in more of the nitty gritty of the library's history than I have been able to cover here tonight, copies of A Necessity of Life are available for sale in the Friends Gift Store. And I think you can probably also check it out from the library collection. <laughs> I thank you very much for your attention, and if there are any comments or questions, I'd love to hear them. Yes. I want to say I really enjoyed your book, and also your talk tonight was an excellent kind of summary of the library. Thank you, I appreciate that. It's hard to boil 100 years down into <laughs> an hour or so. <laughs> yes? Um, one piece I didn't know is when we were talking about the teenagers who had all, had all the literature, mm -hmm. there was something referred to as the bitters block. Yeah. What is that? Is that, is that a location? Or? It's a location. And I'm not exactly sure which one. There were two buildings on Main Street that were referred to at various times as the Bitters Block. And I'm not exactly sure which one. There was one that was on the east side of Main between 3rd and 4th, and it would be somewhere in where the, if you know what the Mitzelfeld building is, it would have been somewhere in there. And there was another building that was at times referred to the bidder's block that stood where the bank is. And it was torn down so that the bank could be built. And, and I'm not sure which one was housing the library. I sort of suspect the one on the Mitzelfield location, but I'm not 100% sure. Yes? When you mentioned the Mitzelfield, Integrated totally, totally with 
they had their own self-interest of mm -hmm. bringing trans, you know, people to yeah. town. But that statement is what gave it to me at million. We would not have been able to afford, we couldn't spend $3 million on the site when we had $10 million to build and, and buy. Right. So uh, it was their gift is what kept the library in Rochester. And, and really it was Monty's little statement that sort of flipped them. And then when we sold North Rochester, we were able to get all the money that we had put in to the purchase of the property, the design of the building that never came to be, we made a little bit. We didn't lose anything on that property. We broke it, but it was about 10 years later. <laughs> An interesting thing about the North Rochester Road property, the library board probably didn't realize it at the time, but it was buying a piece of the Barwise farm and Eva Barwise was one of the original library, members of the library board of trustees and had been the librarian for the women's club library that preceded Avon Township Public Library. So there's, every thread you pull is connected to something else. It's a, t a whole tapestry. Everybody's got a connection somewhere. You talk about six degrees of separation, there's a lot less than that in this in the history of this town. Yes, sir. Uh, question, so like today, you can get almost anything from the library. But there was a time when libraries were of books and periodicals. Was the expansion of materials lent out a gradual thing? Or was there a period when there was a real expansion in the number of things that the library would lend out? Well, it happened over time. But you have to understand that libraries, a lot of people think that libraries curated books. What they really did was provide information and curate information. Your objective was to have the information in your collection that your people need. And we didn't want to discriminate the format. Whatever you could use to bring that information to people, you did. It might be a book. It might be a periodical. It, now it might be an e-book. It, it's a file online, and this is why the library was a leader in bringing the internet to people also, because the internet was another way to deliver information. People didn't even know what it was in 1994, but the libraries were aware of it, and they said, hey, this could be something. This could be a game changer for us, and so Rochester Hills jumped in with both feet. They were a leader. Other people followed, and now you couldn't even think of a library without an internet connection because it allows instantaneous document delivery from anywhere in the world, which is part of the library's mission to connect the information to the person that needs it. Thank you very much for coming out on a snowy night.